Well, good morning, Sabbath School. It's such a pleasure to gather together on Sabbath morning here in West Virginia to study and learn and worship together. And I want to welcome each one who is with us in the classroom and by phone. And we're going to start with prayer. So if you're able, would you please kneel with me? Father, we're so thankful we can come together as a group and come together to meet you at your throne of grace and to be taught of you. And we ask for your spirit, just like Elisha asked for your spirit uh, through, as he had seen work in Elijah. So please help us be with those we love, be with our families, every concern that's on our heart and mind. We leave with you and ask you to work out your goodwill. Now bless us as we study and read, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we get into our lesson, and it's our last lesson about the life of Elijah, and it culminates in that wonderful experience of the chariot coming down and, uh, and inviting Elisha in. And our text to remember this morning is from 2 Kings 2.11, which states, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked. You see, uh, Elijah and Elisha had visited three of the schools of the prophets together. And then as they left the last one, they went on and talked, and came to the River Jordan and went over the River Jordan. So they were talking together, and we don't know what they were um, talking about. It's not recorded, but I can only assume that it was about Elisha and the work ahead of him and the need for him to stay faithful and be um, uh, strong in the Lord. You see, the schools of the uh, the st students at the school of the prophet Elijah and Elisha all realized that the time was close when Elijah would be taken from them, and so they they were having their last talk on this earth. The text goes on that behold. You see, as they still went on and talked, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So our lesson is going to cover some of these points. But before we get into it, I thought it would be nice to focus on this River Jordan, this river that Elisha struck with his mantle and it parted so they could pass over. So let me open up that particular slide presentation. There we go. The river, the Jordan River. Now, we first, no, we don't first read about it, but we do read about God's interaction with this river in Joshua 3. So let's open our Bibles to Joshua 3. Starting in verse 13, the text says, And it came to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and heap. Verse um, 14, and it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people and as they bear the Ark were come unto Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water for Jordan overfloweth all her banks 
all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap from far, very far from the city of Adam, and that is beside Zeratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed right over against Jericho. This is when, of course, the Israelites were entering the land of Canaan. They had to pass over Jordan, and there were no bridges. Now, Jordan has fords. The river is shallow in certain places, and people can walk over, but not here. Evidently, it said the waters over... Uh, flowed their borders. Now let's look at Exodus 14 for another example where God intervened with waters. 14 verse 21 states, sorry I shouldn't have done it that way, 21 states, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, i.e. the Red Sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So God, of course, is able, but he helped his people as they were leaving Egypt and as they were crossing in to the land of promise. Now here's a map from BibleHistory.com, free to download, that shows you the um, geographical area of the Jordan River. In the um, top half, you will see the Sea of Galilee here, and then, of course, the Jordan River winds down to the Dead Sea. And there are hills on each side, but along the east side, that's pretty dry, arid land. Along the west side, also dry and arid land. Now, Smith's Bible Dictionary says this. The two principal features in its course are its descent and its windings. From its fountain heads to the Dead Sea, it rushes down one continuous inclined plain, only broken by a series of rapids or precipitous falls. Between the Lake of Gennesaret and the Dead Sea, there are 27 rapids. The depression of the Lake of Gennesaret below the level of the Mediterranean is 653 feet, and that of the Dead Sea, 1,316 feet. The whole descent from its source in the north to the Dead Sea is 3,000 feet. Its width varies from 45 to 180 feet, and it is from 3 to 12 feet deep, according to uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary. Going on, and this is from Erdman's Bible Dictionary, the Jordan figures prominently in events recorded in the Bible. In other words, it is the river of Israel that we read most about in the Bible. It is first mentioned going on in the Old Testament in the account of Abram and Lot, Genesis 13, 10 through 11, when the two decided to separate. Lot chose to take his herds to the rich plain of the Jordan. Later, Jacob crossed the river on his journey to Abram, uh, Genesis 13, 10. Now, in the map, you saw brown arid area on the west and the east side of the Jordan. But close to the river, and I'll show you a picture of this later, <clears throat> close to the river is greenery. And, and, and there were, it was good land to grow things. So close to the river is probably um, desirable land going on. In this dictionary, the Jordan was the final obstacle facing the Israelites before they could enter into the promised land. Moses' dying wish was to cross the river, and to do so was Joshua's first command from the Lord. 
The miraculous dry crossing of the Jordan opened the way for the destruction of Jericho. Going on, the Jordan remained a military obstacle through the period of the judges into the early monarchy. Remember, Syria was uh, its enemy. And Syria was to the east of the River Jordan, but there were no good places to cross often. So they would have to go up north and around and come down. <clears throat> so, nevertheless, uh, there were fords along the river, and these control of these fords was critical in a number of battles, and a lot of texts are listed here uh, that illustrate that. Some of the stories of Elijah and Elisha are set in the Jordan Valley. There they and their disciples gathered, and in that vicinity the two prophets performed a number of miracles. The Jordan is also the backdrop for events recorded in the Gospels. John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan, and Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Until the first decade of the 21st century, in other words, in our current um, period, time period, the waters of the Jordan River had been the largest water source for Israel. Lately, desalinated seawater from the Mediterranean has taken over this role. Israel's national water carrier, completed in 1964, has delivered water from the Sea of Galilee to the Israeli coastal plain for over four decades, until prolonged drought led to abandoning this solution in favor of desalination. Here's a picture of one of the rapids in the Jordan River, people navigating the rapids. Here's an aerial picture of the Jordan River, and it shows the windy nature of this river. And here's a picture. You can see that blue pencil-like stream in the middle. That's the Jordan River as it empties into the Dead Sea. And I chose this picture to show you how barren the land is on either side of the Jordan River. But if you look closely down where the pencil-type river is, you can see darkness. And that's greenery. That's water, uh, land that's watered well by the Jordan River and is conducive to growth. And here's a picture of a baptismal pool in the Jordan River. Okay, now we're ready to move on to our lesson study today, the conclusion of Elijah the Tishbite. And on the, on the first slide, you will see the conclusion is based in 2 Kings 1 and 2, but we're going to go back to 1 Kings to the call of Elisha, because the lives of Elisha and Elijah are intermingled closely during this latter part of Elijah's life. So let's open up our Bibles to 1 Kings 19. I know we've read this before, but I want to review this call of Elisha, starting in verse 16, near the, uh, the latter half. God gave instruction that Elisha, uh, excuse me, Elijah was to anoint Elisha, the son of Shapheth, of Abel-Meholah, um, to be prophet in thy room. And this is one reason I'm going back to this uh, verse, because we haven't discussed this phrase, prophet in thy room. This is a way of saying that God was telling Elijah, to anoint his successor. In thy room means in thy place. Prophet in thy place. 
Prophets and Kings 217.1 states, God had bidden Elijah anoint another to be prophet in his stead. And that phrase, in his stead, we know means in the place of someone or something. God was telling Elijah, and we don't know how much more. It's not recorded for us. How much more God told him about the future years of his life. But the first thing that he was to do as he left to go back, or one of the first things, was to anoint Elisha, to be his successor, um, to, to be the prophet in his place, in his room, you see, instead of him, his successor, going on. Uh, we know that Elijah's family did not bow the knee to Baal. They were one of the 7,000 that remained faithful to God during the great apostasy of the Israelites under Jezebel and under King Ahab. Uh, Leslie Harding has written a book entitled Elisha, Man of God, and he has this to say. Well, I've put a few edits in, dropped a few words to condense it, but these are his words. Elijah sets forth to obey God. He leaves the cave and he's on his okay. way back. These are my words now. To obey God. Going on. The road he takes will probably lead east of the Dead Sea and up the River Jordan. In the highlands of Gilead he finds the farm of Shapheth at Abel Mahoalah. Mahoalah. In the years of apostasy, Shaphat and his wife have lived by faith in God. They named their son Elisha, which means God is my salvation. So Elisha was born there on the farm. Um, father and mother were faithful to God. And a named, even named their son, God is my salvation. Now, we also want to look at this idea back in 1 Kings 19. Let me find the verse. Verse 19. So he, i.e. Elijah, departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. Now, sometimes you will see uh, a painting or a drawing, a rendition of this, of Elisha plowing. And you will see 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him in groups of two, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and Elisha pulling the, the plow behind them. But this most likely is incorrect. And the reason I say so, and the SDA Bible commentary brings that out, that out also, is that Prophets and Kings in 218 Point one, Ellen White states, the prophetic call came to Elisha while with his father's servants he was plowing in the field. So we can't assume that all 12 yoke of oxen were hooked up to Elijah. His servants, the father's servants, were also uh, plowing in the field. And so these oxen were distributed among the servants plowing. Okay, we're reading from Prophets and Kings 217.2. Elisha's father was a wealthy farmer, a man whose household were among the number that in a time of almost universal apostasy had not bowed the knee to Baal. Theirs was a home where God was honored and where allegiance to the faith of ancient Israel was the rule of daily life. In such surroundings, the early years of Elisha were passed in the quietude of country life under the teaching of God and nature and the discipline of useful work. He received the training in habits of simplicity and of obedience to his parents and to God that helped to fit him for the high position he was afterward to occupy. Quietude of country life, nature, useful work, simplicity, obedience, these things helped Elisha. 
going on in Prophets and Kings, he had taken up the work that lay nearest. He possessed both the capabilities of a leader among men and the meekness of one who is ready to serve, of a quiet and gentle spirit. He was nevertheless energetic and steadfast. Integrity, fidelity, and the love and fear of God were his, and in the humble round of daily toil he gained strength of purpose and nobleness of character, constantly increasing in grace and knowledge, while cooperating with his father in the home life duties he was learning to cooperate with God. Now, I'm not sure I have a slide that um, addresses something here, but I just want to, for us to notice that Elisha was of a quiet and gentle spirit. Would you say Elijah was that way? Probably not. And so the two of them were joining forces, living under the same roof. The houses weren't big enough where you could separate very easily. A quiet, gentle spirit with uh, uh, the spirit of Elijah. And uh, we'll read later on that Elisha had many temptations. And that's coming up. But here we have two different personalities, but both called of God to serve him. Going on. By faithfulness and little things, Elisha was preparing for weightier trusts day by day through practical experience. He gained a fitness for broader, higher work. He learned to serve, and in learning this, he learned also how to instruct and lead. The lesson is for all, and here's an important point. None can know what may be God's purpose in his discipline, i.e., in the things that come across our path, things that we are responsible for, things that we have to make decisions about, things that we have to plod through. Uh, in other words, we cannot know what God's purpose is in this discipline. But, she goes on to say, all may be certain that faithfulness in little things is the evidence of fitness for greater responsibilities. Um, one of the ways I help Smyrna is by being treasurer. And I keep databases, <laughs> many of them, because we um, have the Smyrna Chapel, Smyrna Gospel Ministries. I have to keep everything straight. And it's all small, te detailed, tedious it can be tedious work. I double-check everything as I put it in the database. But one keystroke can make a difference, you see. <clears throat> and But faithfulness in my own little... Before I became treasurer, uh, I was assistant treasurer, and Anne took care of everything. But even before that, I had to be faithful in my own mathematics, in my own home, in little details in my home to prepare me for doing this. And I know all of you have a checking account, most likely, that you have to um, keep track of and make sure it's correct. A mistake can lead to consequences we don't like, like fees and charges. And, and so um, we all have to do that. But also honesty is involved because we know in the world that um, people steal from other people and they fix the books. And we know things are going on now with an ex-president who's facing consequences or the charges, I should say, alleged charges, because people uh, don't have the godly goodness about them and the desire to be like Jesus. And so here she says, all may be certain that faithfulness in little things, whether it's caring for someone or whether it's, I don't know, what you know, any little thing that you're doing, you must be faithful because it's fitness. It's a fitness for greater responsibilities going on. Every act of life is a revelation of character, and he only who in small duties 
proves himself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, can be honored by God with higher service. 2 Timothy 2.15 As Elijah, divinely directed in seeking a successor, passed the field in which Elisha was plowing, he cast upon the young man's shoulder the mantle, she calls it the mantle of consecration, During the famine, the family of Shaphat had become familiar with the work and mission of Elijah, and now the Spirit of God impressed Elisha's heart as to the meaning of the prophet's act. To him it was the signal that God had called him to be the successor of Elijah. Here's a young man plowing in the field, doing the humble duties of the farm. And now he realized God is calling him to be the successor of Elijah. Ellen White tells us Elijah was the greatest prophet to that point since Moses. Elijah had fought apostasy and um, the apostate King Ahab, etc., Jezebel, on his own, of course, with God, but with no human support. And now Elisha realized he was um, being called to take the place. Now I'm just going to go here and make sure we have the phones muted so that background noise doesn't come in. Going on. The call to place all on the altar of service comes to each one. We are not all asked to serve as Elisha served, nor are we all bidden to sell everything we have. But God asks us to give his service the first place in our lives, to allow no day to pass without doing something to advance his work in the earth. And you might think, well, does that mean I have to preach? Does that mean I have to be a missionary? It means in your home doing something to advance the cause of God in this world, sharing a cheering word, giving direction or help or whatever it is. These are the things that we can do, and we're not to allow a day to pass without doing something for someone else that helps them take a step closer to heaven going on. He does not expect all... He does not expect from all the same kind of service. One may be called to ministry in a foreign land. Another may be asked to give of his means for the support of gospel work. God accepts the offering of each. It is the consecration of the life and all its interests that is necessary. Those who make this consecration and I'm adding from head to toe, your whole life is consecrated and devoted to serving God. Those who make this consecration will hear and obey the call of heaven, just like Elisha must have already made that consecration in his heart. So when the call came, he was ready. Going on, prophets and kings, for several years, we don't know how many, The Bible doesn't tell us, but for Ellen White tells us for several years after the call of Elisha, Elijah and Elisha labored together, the younger man daily gaining greater preparedness for his work. Elijah had been God's instrument for the overthrow of gigantic evils. The idolatry, which, supported by Ahab and the heathen Jezebel, had seduced the nation, had been given a decided check. Baal's prophets had been slain. The whole people of Israel had been deeply stirred, and many were returning to the worship of God as Elijah's successor, Elisha, by careful, patient instruction must endeavor to guide Israel in safe paths. His association with Elijah, here we go, the greatest prophet since the days of Moses, prepared him for the work he was soon to take up alone. 
Elisha's life after uniting with Elijah, here is the other reference I was making, was not without temptations. Trials he had in abundance. But in every emergency he relied on God. He was tempted to think of the home that he had left. But to this temptation he gave no heed. Having put his hand to the plow, he was resolved not to turn back, and through test and trial he proved true to his trust. Now, we're not told what the many temptations or these trials were that he had in abundance, but it was enough to make him think, I wish, or make the thought cross his mind at least, of the home where things were easier, better, more peaceful, perhaps. I don't know. But whatever he was going through, the temptation was to think of his home. And you can be sure that Satan was saying, you don't have to do this. You can go back and serve God on the farm like you were before this. I'll start it. But no, even though Elisha was gentle and of a quiet spirit, he was determined. And so, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. It doesn't matter whether you are educated in um, many things or simple in your understanding of many things. It doesn't matter. What matters is your determination to be faithful to God, come what may. And we know, you and I know, intellectually, that there is no other way. God is the only way. The master of the universe is the only way to any life, whether it be life eternal or life on this earth. If you're a secular humanist, or whatever, and even an atheist, you have to, um, you may most likely come to the point to realize God's way is best. Satan's way, he can offer you pleasures for a moment. He can offer you fame. He can offer you riches. But in the end, it is nothing it is foolishness, and, it, and worse than that, it brings despondency, depression, and even suicidal thoughts because it's all devoid of God, all devoid of that inner joy, peace, um, comfort that only God can give going on. So Ahab was still on the scene, excuse me, Elijah was still on the scene after he left the cave and called Elisha to be his successor. Uh, He was still working for God. He rebuked Ahab, King Ahab, over the death of Naboth. But he did more. The schools of the prophets established by Samuel, we're told in Prophets and Kings, had fallen into decay during the years of Israel's apostasy. Elijah reestablished these schools. Now, some people have um, envisioned Elijah as a loner, living up in the mountains, just coming down to rebuke Ahab, or coming down to meet at Mount Carmel, or whatever. But he was really a loner. He was um, uh, out in the wilderness, whereas Elisha was more of a person that liked other people and spoke to other people, walked with other people, lived in towns and so forth, but not Elijah. But this isn't true. Elijah established the schools of the prophets. He had to work with other people to do that. Reestablished, I should say. I. Uh, He reestablished these schools going on, making provision for young men to gain an education that would lead them to magnify the law and make it honorable. Three of these schools, one at Gilgal, one at Bethel, and one at Jericho, are mentioned in the record, i.e. in the Bible. Just before Elijah was taken to heaven, 
he and Elisha visited these centers of training. The lessons that the prophet of God had given them on former visits, he now repeated. Especially did he instruct them concerning their high privilege of loyally maintaining their allegiance to the God in heaven. Just stop for a minute, and in your mind's eye, it, it's true, Elijah appeared out of nowhere in the throne room of Ahab uh, when we first learn of Elijah. And then he came, appeared again to say rain was coming and to meet at Mount Carmel. And then he ran. He fl fled for fear of his life and ended up at this cave. And that's where God gave him instruction to go back, to do these things, anoint, anoint, anoint. And when he went back, you see, he, he did what, what the Bible doesn't tell us he did. He followed through on all that, but I'll get to that in a minute. He called Elisha. But he also started to work more, uh, interweaving himself with the people, the Israelites, establishing these schools of the prophets so that the young people had a place to go to um, learn about the law and, and how to make it honorable. He, uh, Ellen White also says, especially, <clears throat> pardon me, did he instruct them concerning their high privilege of loyally maintaining their allegiance to the God of heaven. He didn't want them to backslide back into the worship of Baal and the false gods of Jezebel. He didn't want that. And so he was doing all he could to establish their, their feet firmly on the rock of their salvation, to maintain their allegiance, come what may. He also, she says, impressed upon their minds the importance of letting simplicity mark every feature of their education. Now we'll just stop there for a minute. All of us need to... Oh. We all know now how to read, but we all needed to be instructed in how to read, how to perform mathematical equations, how to um, understand uh, the great heavens above us in the study of science, how to understand how a seed grows into a plant and a tree. All of those things are, are good and fine to know, and there is a complexity about them. We know more now about biology, botany, uh, the science, earth sciences, etc., than people ever knew before, but of course, I don't know about the antediluvians. They knew a lot, and their minds were greater than our minds, it's true. But nevertheless, uh, our generation has a lot of knowledge to draw upon, but we cannot get wrapped up into higher criticism, oh, about this is one person writing in the scripture, and here's another person writing another uh, flow of the same story, you know, this higher criticism that came in during the 1800s, and other criticisms that are supposedly sophisticated philosophical criticisms of um, God's Word, so that it just takes away the beauty, the simplicity, the holiness of it. We can't inv get involved with that. And he was impressing these young men to um, let simplicity mark every feature of their education in the scriptures. There was no doubt. There weren't to be doubting. Well, this says that and this is this. Of course, um, uh, they, they had the books of Moses probably to work with, but that may be all. And and so they weren't to dissect it. They were to simply take what it said and put their faith in it as the word of God. Only in this way, she continues, could they receive the mold of heaven and go for, forth to work in the ways of the Lord. Going on. 
SDA Bible Commentary. This is Edwin Thiel speaking. By Oh, and this is, well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we'll bring it in now and we'll get back to it. But remember, after they crossed the Jordan, and Elijah asked Elisha, ask now what I can do for you. And he asked for a double portion of his spirit. Edwin Thiel explains, By asking for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, Elisha was not asking for double the power of Elijah. Maybe you've thought that. He was not asking for more than had been given to the older prophet, i.e. Elijah. Nor was he asking for a higher position or more ability than had been given to Elijah. And maybe you've thought that this, when we pray, give me a double portion of your spirit. It's not, Elijah wasn't, according to Thiel and according to another source, and uh, you can come to your conclusions, but let me share. The, the Hebrew phrase employed in this request is the same as that in Deuteronomy 27, excuse me, 2117, denoting the proportion of a father's property that was to be given to the eldest son going on. So the request of Elisha was only that he might be treated, according to the SDA Bible commentary, as the eldest son of the departing prophet, and that he might receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit as compared with that which would be given to any of the others of the sons of the prophets. What he was asking for was an acknowledgement of a spiritual birthright that he might be regarded as the firstborn spiritual son of the elder prophet, and that he might be thus enabled to continue the work begun by Elijah. Now, Harding brings this same concept out. You will re recollect, he says, uh, that the firstborn of every family received an extra share of his father's property. If a man like Benjamin, for instance, had ten sons, his property was divided into eleven parts. At his death, the nine younger boys received one portion each, whereas the heir, excuse me, whereas the heir was given two. Being the son through whom the name of his father was to be continued, he was honored. At first, through him passed the rulership and priesthood of the tribe, and in order that he might properly discharge these responsibilities, he was granted a double portion, Deuteronomy 21, 17. So, when Elisha requested a double portion, he asked that he might be regarded as Elijah's heir. He had been called to service and had been trained for his task, but now he longed to share his master's spirit to exercise his power to carry on his work, to vindicate the cause of God, to struggle against the adversary, and to work for the blessing and prosperity of God's people as Elijah had done. Make me your son with your spirit and power was the meaning of his petition. He desired to follow closely in his master's footsteps. And so, and remember, when Elijah was taken away, he called him his father, my father, my father. So there is that connection. And so it's possible to understand this in the, in the sense that he wanted to carry on the work of Elijah. He knew he was his successor, but he wanted the people to understand that he was walking and doing the work, the same work of Elijah, he was carrying that on. So that, that will stop there about Elisha for now. And another instruction God gave Elijah was to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. We read this uh, in 1 Kings 19.16. The first part, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. Now let's turn to 2 Kings. 
chapter 9. And I have the first 16 verses marked here. Let me just see. Let's read them. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thy, thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, he was a prophet, we don't know his name, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel, and thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Baasha, Baasha the son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Now down to 20. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again, and the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi. Now I put that in because earlier we read about Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Nimshi was his grandfather, and uh, Jehu was re really the grandson of Nimshi, being the son of Jehoshaphat, who was the son of Nimshi, but he is commonly known as the son of Nimshi. The Hebrew word for son may be used to designate, designate grandsons or even more distant descendants. And so, here we have Elisha giving directions to a prophet to go and anoint Jehu. And it's interesting reading. I would read the rest of, after I stopped at, um, was it verse 10? I would read, maybe this afternoon if I were you, the rest of what happened. Because Jehu accepted it, he told the people and went right away, if we can um, assume that the text is flowing pretty close to events, to um, Jezebel and Ahab. And so Jehu was the grandson of Nimshi, but he is called in other places the son of Nimshi, and, and that's not a contradiction. And Elisha is making the preparation for this anointing. We don't read anywhere in Scripture that Elijah anointed him. But Elisha was walking in the footsteps of Elijah, remember. and But also remember that we just have a sketchy history of things that happened during this time period. Uh, in heaven, hope we will know the real history. Right now we just have bits and pieces. And this piece is in Second Kings where Elisha sent a prophet to anoint Jehu. Now, what about this anointing of Hazael to be king over Israel? This was another instruction of God to Elijah. Let's read in chapter 8, backing up, starting in verse 7. 
and Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad the king of Syria was sick, and it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thy hand, thine hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath shewed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepest, or weepeth, my lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what is thy servant, a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath shewed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to the, his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazazel, Hazael, excuse me, reigned in his stead. And so uh, this doesn't say, does it say, did I miss it, that Elisha anointed Hazael? Let me just look back here. He tells him he will be king. The Lord shewed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha. It doesn't tell us in this section uh, anything about anointing. And we don't know. The Bible, as far as I'm aware, maybe you know, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about the anointing of Hazael. But he did become king, and he became king by killing the current king going on. Now, Ahab and Jehoshaphat met together in 1 Kings 22. There's kind of like an intermission from 19 where Elijah is sent back, go back, and to work for God, to uh, uh, call Elisha. He's sent back, and then we have this like a, uh, an intermission between the missions of Elisha Elijah with this battle at Ramoth Gilead. And, and there's a prophet involved, Micaiah. And in this battle, the death of Ahab takes place. And his son Ahaziah becomes king of Israel. He's also called the king of Samaria in a portion of the scripture. So Ahab and Jehoshaphat join forces at this battle of Ramoth Gilead. Let's look at 1 Kings 22, and read just a little bit of what's going on, why they went to battle. It involves Syria. Verse 1, And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. Um, let me just back up. If you can envision the map I had up uh, 15, 20 minutes ago about the Jordan River, and a, we read some text where God parted the ways of the Red Sea as well as the Jordan River. Although there were fords 
in different sections of the Jordan River. Some, and probably most of the sections, weren't crossable. There was no bridge across them. There was a bridge across the Jordan River, uh, I've read, during the time of Christ, but not during this time. And so uh, we have Elijah smoting the river, and the river parted. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this, uh, for Syria, remember, if you can envision the map in your mind, to the east of Jordan and north was Syria. And they couldn't just cross the river and get to the Israelites, usually, unless they were at a ford. But they would go north, and they would Go north and come around and come down to the Israelites and have battle. And so here we have in, in the plains of the Jordan River, verse 2 of 20, chapter 22, And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat the king of Judah came down to the king of Israel. So it says, came down. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth Gilead is ours, and we be still? And take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? Earlier on, the king of Syria captured Ramoth Gilead. And then the king of Syria was defeated, and he promised to give back the cities that he captured. But evidently, he hadn't given back Ramoth Gilead yet. And so Ahab and Jehoshaphat said, um, we're sitting here doing nothing. Let's go up and take it, is what the idea is. And in verse 4, And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And so they prepare for battle. And in this battle, Ahab is killed. And that's the death of Ahab. But before they go to battle, they ch call their prophets. And all their prophets say, yes, go, the Lord will bless thee, uh, you, you, you'll do good. Except Micaiah. And I guess it would be good if I opened up again to 1 Kings 22. And let's read what Micaiah prophesies. Starting, 22, starting in verse 15. Well, let's back up to 13. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare the, um, good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of the one of them, of one of them, and speak that which is good. Verse 14, And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto Micaiah, Shall we go, to, go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or sh shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it unto the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I abjure thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? So it must have been either the king had doubts, or that Micaiah spoke it in such a, uh, a way that the king knew he's just um, making fun, or he's just jeering me, or whatever. But nevertheless... How many times have I told thee? And so in verse 17, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the kings of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou, therefore, the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? And then we have the scene of taking place in heaven that 
I will go as a lying spirit and speak in the mouths of these prophets to deceive. And, and so they go to war. Now we have something else happening with Elijah before he's translated. And we read about it in 2 Kings 1. So now we're going to move over to 2 Kings 1, starting in 2, verse 2. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber, and was in Samaria, and was sick. And he sent messengers, and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, <clears throat> and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel, that ye go to inquire of Baalzebub, the king of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, and but shall, shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, there came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these things, these words? And they answered him, He was an hairy man. Now we're getting a description we've never had before of Elijah. He was an hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent unto him, a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. Now here's where some people get the idea. He was a loner. He lived out in the wilderness, and here he is sitting on the top of a hill. That doesn't mean that, but at this case, he's on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he sent unto him, verse 11, another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now let's just stop for a minute. Here's Elijah sitting on a rock on the hill. The king wants to see Elijah. Instead of sending a messenger and asking him, will you come back with me? The king would like to talk with you. He sends a messenger. Um, the messenger he sends has 50 armed men. In other words, they're going to take him captive. If he will just come down, we're going to escort you, but you're not going to escape, you see. And so the first two groups were destroyed. And now we're in verse 13. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty and his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. 
Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Let Therefore let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down. And so there was, um, it seems to infer there was a a reason Elijah didn't go with the first two. Um, He was fearful of his life. But this time he, he couldn't really flee. He depended on God to take care of that. And the third group, God said, be not fearful, but go with him. So Ahaziah dies and Joram reigns. And now we're getting to the beautiful, oh, it's time, 1043, to the beautiful part of going over Jordan and what happens. Um, Elijah knows, Elisha knows, the sons of the prophets at Jericho know the time is near. The time is near. Today, the Jordan River, and this is another place, we read the fords, but for the most part, the Jordan River is today uh, about 50 feet deep or to 200 feet deep. That's what um, one source said. And so there, God told Elijah to go over Jordan. And so he does this. Now, we don't know why. There is nothing over Jordan in that area but the wilderness. But God wanted this to happen, this translation, this appearance of the chariot, not to be, not to happen near the schools of the prophets, not to happen in territory on the west of Jordan, but to go over to the east of Jordan. However, It must not have been a place of fording. So uh, uh, Elijah takes up his mantle and strikes the river, and it parts for them. Now, uh, I I know it's time to close. Let me see. Oh, this is the last slide. Um, And the Bible we read, the Bible tells us that this fire chariot came between them. Remember, they had been walking and talking. We don't know what Elijah was telling Elisha, but I, I feel certain it was his last counsel about how to be faithful and maintain allegiance to the God of heaven and how to lead and guide the people in the schools of the prophets. And it, all the things that, you see, we're told that when they made their visit for the last time to these three schools of the prophets, Elijah reiterated what he had taught these young men all along, to be faithful, <clears throat> to, to simply uh, believe the scriptures and the law of God. And so, he, I'm sure that this quiet time between them was valuable and full of advice because the time was at hand. And they crossed over, and the chariot came and divided them, and Elijah is taken away. And I just want to leave you with the thought, Elisha is now alone. If you've ever lost a loved one, You might understand the grief or the pain he may have been experiencing. He was able and relied upon Elijah for instruction, for guidance, for um, solving the issues that uh, God's people were faced with. And now he's alone. He's got Elijah's mantle. He's asked for the spirit of Elijah so that that a double portion so that he can do the works of Elijah and and he crosses this river in the same way they came across the first time. But he's walking alone. Of course he isn't alone and we are never alone, even though it may seem like it. Even though we may be grieving the loss 
of a loved one who's been our support, who's helped us, who's guided, had words of wisdom, whatever. We are now alone, and Elisha was now alone. But we are never alone, and never was he alone. And this, um, the presence of God was demonstrated right then when Elisha smote the waters and they parted, and we're going to close there. God has a plan for each one of us. We are never alone. We may not understand the things we're going through, but they are preparing us for something in the future. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you will be our companion this day, that you will walk through the rest of the Sabbath hours, especially close with us. May we hear your voice. May we know your guidance, your your, um, finger that's pointing the way out before us. Help us, Father. Help us to have the strength and purpose of both Elijah and Elisha. May they be embedded in our brains, in our minds. Elisha was quiet and dignified. Elijah was more uh, brash. Help us to have these qualities as they're needed to serve you, I pray. Be with each one listening. Whatever heartfelt desire is present, speak to that person in words they know. Just as Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. We want you to speak and guide and direct us, Lord. Bless each one. They're so important to you. Bless our families, our loved ones, near and far. May they also heed the call to follow you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, may God bless and keep you. And may you stay faithful, be strong, as both Elijah and Elisha were. Bye for now.